Right now, spacecraft communicate and send data back and forth using radio frequencies, much like your car radio. Well, the Opal's investigation is proving that it can now be done with lasers. I caught up with Matt Abrahamson at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory to learn why Opal's may be the gem scientists are looking for. We launched up to the space station in April 2014 and we're a technology demonstration mission for laser communications uh, technology that's sending uh, data over laser beams rather than radio waves. Why is that so important? Uh, well, basically a laser beam is much more focused than a radio wave, uh, so for the a small amount of power that's transmitted, uh, you can transmit much more information. Um, it's also at a uh, higher frequency than radio waves, so you can pack more bits into that same data stream. So you can get data rates that are 10 to 100 times faster than the potential for radio waves. So we've, we've practiced this a few times. We've, we've seen it in action. How did it work? Oh, it worked great. Um, we got up there in April, as I mentioned. Uh, we started operating in May. Uh, everything checked out as, as expected. Uh, went through a few checks to make sure we can point um, because one of the major technologies of this is to demonstrate that we can point within a few microradians of uh, the target ground station. And we had our first uh, success on June 5th, uh, where we were able to actually transmit a high definition video from the space station on Opals down to our ground station um, in Table Mountain, California. So how does that work? With, is, is there crew involvement with this, or is it just strictly from the ground? Uh, there's no crew involvement. We're an external payload, so we sit on the outside on Express Logistics Carrier 1, and everything's ground commanded from JPL. Uh, we send the commands from there. They go over to Marshall Space Flight Center, then to Johnson Space Flight Center, to White Sands, up through Tidris, all the way over to our payload in a few, matter of a few seconds, which is uh, kind of incredible. Uh, so we command each step in the process uh, to prepare for uh, this transmission, and uh, during the actual time period of the transmission, which is about two and a half minutes, when we pass over the ground station, uh, everything's automated at that point, so we have this closed-loop tracking algorithm that will track our ground station and transmit that video down to the ground. It's the story of an endless search to serve the communications needs of America. Why the hurry? So when we transmit things, you, you transmitted a video, uh, are you trying to transmit several things at once, or is it one at a time? How does that work? Uh, it's one video, and we'll continuously loop it, so there may be dropouts during the middle of the transmission. Um, Typically we're transmitting at 50 megabits per second and our standard video is about 175 megabits. So every three and a half seconds you get a new copy of the video. Uh, but you could have dropouts in the middle so we, we have an algorithm that if you do have a few packet dropouts, uh, when we reconstruct it on the ground you can take different portions of the video from uh, different packets that were received and reconstruct one video. Now in practice um, it worked much better than expected so our bit error rate was so low it seemed like every copy we got the full copy. Uh, there were a few instances where we hit clouds, and if you hit a cloud with the laser, um, you have a dropout. So we did have a couple instances where you had 10 seconds of dropout, but we'd have enough of the video transmission to reconstruct a complete video at the end. How does this translate to long duration missions? This is what we're, we're headed toward, right? Uh, yeah, that's right. Um, so I think this is really important for uh, deep space. Um, from JPL's perspective, uh, we'd like to put one of these on a Mars orbiter or even a Mars rover. Um, and then that really increases the bandwidth of the amount of science data you can get back from the surface of Mars. Instead of taking snapshots of images, you could take video data and send that back to Earth. You can't do that right now. Um, it also will be a, a big game changer in terms of manned spaceflight. Um, we're going out to deep space, even to the moon. Um, you want to have as much bandwidth as possible to talk to those astronauts. And you're going to need laser count for that. So what's next for Opals? Well, we're going to be on the uh, station through February 2016. Uh, that's our current decommissioning date. Um, and we have a few more uh, demonstrations uh, that we're looking to do. Uh, we just completed one, which is an adaptive optics experiment. Um, in that experiment, we took a test bed that would take the opal signals that re was received at the telescope, and it corrects all the atmospheric distortion that occurred as it was transmitted down. We're able to couple that into a fiber optics cable, and that just demonstrates that we're able to take this signal and um, transmit to fiber optics cable, possibly for transmission out to other ground stations. So that was an important technology to test out. Um, the next thing we'll be testing is a platform characterization experiment. That's an attempt to try to measure the vibration or the shaking on the space station. So it's not really optical communications, but based on our capabilities using lasers, uh, we can get some useful measurements out of it. And then the fall time frame, we're looking to do more transmissions to our foreign partners. Uh, that's ESA in the Tenerife, Canary Islands. That's uh, DLR in Oberfaffenhof in Germany. NICT in Tokyo, Japan, and possibly Kness in uh, Nice, France. 
So uh, those will be nice collaborations to have before we, we end the program in February. So it's important to have those other ground stations around the world. That's right. I think both for collaboration and also looking at the uh, variations you get with uh, geometry variations. Um, when we operate in California, uh, the weather is fairly good uh, for transmission of laser beams. When we operate in Germany, it's a little more challenging, and so we learn new things. Uh, it's also a much higher latitude in the planet, and so the link availability and, and when we can transmit is quite a bit different from transmitting California. And so by looking at those variations, we're learning a lot about how robust this technology is for the future.